Hello friends, this is Sanjeev Kaushik and welcome to my channel Methodical Trades. Just a few days ago, I had released a video on 9 mistakes that option writers often make and we ended up doing a mistake ourselves. While doing the editing, my editor actually put on something on the screen that was making the message very convoluted when I was talking about one of the mistakes. And the mistake was the difference between Iron Condor and Iron Fly and why one strategy is better than the other. However, this time I have decided to reshoot this video. And I've also decided to actually prepare a separate video on comparing the Iron Fly with Iron Condor because I think the topic is big enough that it requires an exclusive video of its own. So keep an eye out, I'll be releasing a video on the comparison between the two strategies and we would still share the nine mistakes with you that option writers often make because I realized that there was one very big mistake that option writers make but I did not really cover that one. So in this video I will be covering that one as well and without any further ado let's get started. Mistake number one, option sellers relying too much on delta when picking up the strikes to sell the options. Options as instruments as it is are extremely complex in nature, right? It takes a lot of time to master them and start using them profitably for your trading. However, in order to bring down the barrier for retail option writer, what the brokerage industry has done is, and of course they have done it to onboard more and more retail option trader who prefer to sell options. So they've started spreading a propaganda that if you're selling the out of the money options, which are let's say 20 or 15 delta out, and you sell them for expiry of six to eight weeks out, and you keep doing that, if you're challenged, then you roll out your position in time as well as price, then you will be fine. In the long run, you will be profitable. However, this propaganda has a serious flaw. And if you're someone who's looking at delta exclusively, to take your position, stop doing that right away. Delta is definitely an important Greek, but let me tell you something about Greeks itself. I know a lot of option writers who do not look at Greeks at all. You should know them. You should know them like the back of your hand, but that doesn't mean that you should give them too much importance. So what is Delta? Delta is nothing but the first derivative of the price of the underlying. So the Delta will move as the price of the underlying would move. Taking an example, let's say you're sticking with selling 20 delta out of the money options and you do that by selling strangles. So let's say a stock is trading at 100 and you sell 20 out of the money call option at 120 and you also sell 20 out of the money put option at 80 and your expiry is say six weeks out. But the very next day something bad happens with the stock and the stock opens at 80 level. All of a sudden your 80 put that you had sold at 20 delta would now become 50 delta and you would be looking at huge mark to market losses. So much so that even the profits in the sold call option will not be enough to cover for the mark to market losses that you're looking at at your sold put position. And why did this happen? Maybe you're not respecting the levels of the stock. Maybe you didn't know where the resistance or the support is. Maybe you didn't know that there were earnings on the stock around the corner. Uh, there can be many reasons, right? The point is, do not look exclusively at Delta to take your sold option positions. Look at some other data points as well, right? Mistake number two. Just like Delta, sometimes option writers rely too much on the Theta DK as well. Let's take the same example. Let's say now that your stock has fallen to 80, you're hoping that the stock would start consolidating because you still have six weeks to go for expiry. And if the stock remained here for let's say another three to four weeks, then your sold put position will come into profits because of Theta DK. That is the premium of the option would start coming down and you would hopefully be able to exit at break even or at minor losses, right? So if this is your thought process, this again has serious issues. Why? Just because we know this property of options, that is the option prices come down as the time goes on, actually does not really always work in your favor. Because taking the same example, you're actually trying to predict what the stock is going to do in near future. How can you tell that if the stock has fallen from 100 to 80, that it will not fall back down to 60, right? Anything can happen. So you knowing all these properties will actually work against you unless you know that you shouldn't really rely too much on these properties of options, neither on Delta nor on the Theta DK, 
right? So if you would not rely too much on theta decay, then you would know that you either have to do adjustments or you have to keep your strict stop losses. If the stop loss levels have arrived, you have to book out the loss and move on, right? Talking about adjustments. Yes, under this particular scenario or any kind of scenario, there are always adjustments available out there. I myself have released heaps of videos on adjustments along with some examples. And I must admit that I rely too much on adjustments as well. However, this is also a mistake at the same time. And this is my mistake number three. Do not rely too much on adjustments. Look to take the positions that have very high probability of profit right from the beginning. And how do you know that they have very high probability of profit? I will be telling you about that towards the end of this video, right? And, and it's no rocket science, okay? Don't, do not beat me up just because I didn't really give you the holy grail of uh, um, how to take the high probability of profit trades. However, coming back to the adjustments, there are no holy grail even for adjustments as well. Options trading or even trading in general is a zero sum game. If you are taking on adjustments, there are two things happening here. Of course, you're trying to defend your loss making position. And there are no guarantees using any of the adjustment out there that you would be able to come out of this particular position in absolutely no losses or even in profits or let's say break even, right? There are no guarantees. No adjustment is loss proof. And the other scenario can be, let's say you are doing adjustments and they are working fine and there are good chances that you will be able to defend your position uh, in a good way, right? However, while you are doing that, and while you are taking the adjustment trades, you're actually losing out on other opportunities at the same time, right? Maybe if you had your capital and you would have been looking at some other profit making opportunities by selling options on some other underlying, you will not be able to do that because now your capital is blocked on defending your existing loss making trade, right? So it's like putting out fire with more fire. You're already making losses and now you're blocking more capital to defend your loss making position. And as a result, you will not be able to make money that you potentially could have made elsewhere in some other trades, right? So do not rely too much on adjustments. However, at this point, let me tell you one thing. Knowing Greeks is really good, right? Knowing adjustments is even better. So I'm not saying that do not rely on these properties of option trading at all. What I'm saying is do not rely on them in exclusivity, right? Look at them as a whole package related to option trading. So that's the idea of talking about delta, theta and adjustments. In fact, circling back to theta decay, the other related mistake, which is mistake number four that option writers often make is that they do not take their profits in a timely manner, right? You do not have to really stick with your trade just because it's going to expire in six to eight weeks. I take option positions that are going to expire in one, one and a half year. However, I may take them off within a week of entering into those trades, right? So it's not really mandatory for us to stick with the written option positions until they expire. Some people prefer to close out their position when the premium decay has gone to 50. Let's say they sold it for 200 and now the same option is selling for 100. Now they would close it out and make the 50% profit on the total premium that they had received, right? Some people prefer to do it when the premium decay is say 60%, 70% and even 80%, right? However, I would say that sticking with the 50% rule is really good. Why? Because of the unit effect. What is unit effect? When the options start going down in prices because of the premium decay, there comes a certain point when the option premium stops decaying or it slows down so much that it makes no sense for us to stick in that particular trade any longer. And this property of option pricing is called the unit effect. Once a certain unit of the pricing is reached on an option, the DK would slow down so much. And if the underlying price, let's say reverses, then the gamma will actually push the prices of that particular option so high that all of a sudden your profit making trade will start reducing your profits considerably and may even push your position into losses. This is called gamma effect. And it becomes even stronger when we are approaching the expiry, right? So not only the unit effect is telling you that you should be getting out of your written option position after a certain period of time or after your option premiums stop leaking, but also you should be looking to avoid the gamma effect coming into picture and affecting your profits considerably. And this happens a lot of times, right? This is not theoretical. 
I myself have experienced these kind of losses where in the last week I ended up making losses on my written option positions. And therefore, what I usually advise traders is that keep a certain rules for yourself when you're going to exit your positions. In trading, the most important aspect is not when to enter the trade, but when to exit the trade be it after taking profits or after taking losses, right? So keep some rules for yourself. And the rules that I can lay out for you is, and you can pick and choose whichever one you want to go for. Make sure that you are not keeping your written option positions in the last week of expiry, right? Rule number two can be make sure that you are exiting when the premium DK is 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%. 80% is really killing it too much. So 50% is your sweet spot. To give you my example, I would even exit at 5 to 10% of the premium DK. So do not overstay your welcome, right? You have made profits, your view has gone right, and now you are sitting at empty in profits. The worst trader is the one who would let his profit making positions go into losses. Do not be the worst one. Take your profits off the table as soon as you can, right? And do not forget the gamma effect as well as the unit effect when it comes to option pricing. Mistake number five, not adhering to position sizing and effective utilization of capital. Let's talk about the position sizes first. You see, in the stock market or any kind of markets, there's only one thing that you can control and that is how big or small your positions are. Everything else is out of your control. You cannot control how the stock is going to behave, how the markets are behaving, how the commodities are behaving, how the forex is behaving. Absolutely nothing out there in the markets that you can control except for your position sizing, right? So make sure that your position sizes are small enough that you're not going to take huge losses. And there are some formulas that people usually follow. Some people like to follow, let's say, a rule of not losing more than 2% of their capital or 5% of their capital and even 1% of their capital on a single trade. So if you know that this is my strict stop loss and this is how much I'm going to lose and I'm okay to lose this much then you would always sleep peacefully at night regardless of what is happening in the markets, right? So always keep these kind of rules for yourself. The other rule that people usually follow is they prefer to divide their capital by say 50 or 60. And what that means is, let's say you divide your capital by 50. Essentially, you come to the same 2% rule. That is, you will have to take 50 trades and losing 2% in all those trades to eventually bring your entire capital to zero, right? And if you're hopeful that you will not take 50 loss making trades in a row, then obviously you are going to be profitable if you follow this rule, right? So you can divide your entire capital by 50. That will give you the 2% rule. Or if you want to bring it down from 2%, then you can divide your capital by 60, 65, 70. And that will give you the max loss that you should allow yourself to take on on any given position, right? And this is true, not just for option writing, but also for any other kind of trading that you do, be it in spot market, cash market, forex, and so on, right? So keep your position sizing in check. The second point within this mistake is utilizing your capital efficiently. You see, at any given point in time, you should not block more than 50% of the total capital as margin on your sold option positions. You should always keep that remaining 50% as a buffer to do two things. One, take on the adjustment trades. You never know when your existing sold option positions can go into losses, right? If you do not have the capital buffer, you will not be able to take adjustments. And therefore, always keep that 50% buffer of your capital in your account. But the second reason is, if you have blocked your entire capital, and all of a sudden the market's volatility shoots up or it goes down and you had a lot of long positions, let's say, the broker will not feel very comfortable with your positions and they will start allocating more and more margin from your capital to your positions. And this happens very often, right? And it's not that the broker is doing that, but this is how the uh, margin rules are set up in exchanges across the world. There's something called bar, right? This is nothing but the total that you can lose if a uh, certain volatility spikes up or if certain position goes um, overall into red. And they usually compute this value at risk at your portfolio level, right? And in the high volatility periods, this value at risk shoots up. And if value at risk is shooting up, the broker will start allocating more margin to your existing option positions. And all of a sudden you will see that if yesterday the total margin block was 50% of your capital, now it's 70% of your capital. However, if you were already at, let's say 80% of your capital utilized on sold position, 
and your value at risk demands that you keep more capital as margin, you may not have enough buffer, right? And if your margin requirement goes beyond the total capital that you have, then what the broker will do is it, it will start squaring off your existing positions and the chances are that square off will happen at mark to market losses to your account. And the broker doesn't care what kind of fill price that you're getting. They're just going to close off your position at market price. It's going to be a market order inducing even higher losses to you. So never overutilize your capital. Always keep 50% of your capital free for doing adjustments or for rainy days as I explained just now to you. Let's say you have your 50% capital utilized and all of a sudden you're looking at another profit making opportunity and you think that the probability of profit on this particular trade is really good, right? In that scenario, should you exceed the 50% mark or should you do something else? I would say exceed but exceed cautiously. On top of it, if you can take off some of your existing profit making positions and then take that high probability trade, it will be even better. It will really make sure that you are bringing that much needed discipline in your option writing, right? So it would not only force you to take some of the profitable positions off in a timely manner, but it would also make you very disciplined with the capital and how you are utilizing it. Option writing is nothing but utilizing your capital in the best possible manner. It's all about the return on your capital, right? And if you are generating that return on your capital by minimal risk, then perhaps you are a much better trader than the trader who generates the same return on capital but takes huge risks, right? One of the ways of minimizing your risk is position sizing and also effective capital utilization, right? So that was mistake number five. Mistake number six, relying too much on certain other data points, let's say open positions, max pain, and even volumes of option traded. So let's talk about the open interest first. There are two schools of thoughts when it comes to open interest. Sometimes, let's say if a lot of out of the money put options are added at a particular strike, then one school of thought would say that because a lot of option writers have written options at this particular out of the money strike, it should act as a support. The other school of thought would say that it means that people are getting bearish and they're buying a lot of out of the money put options. And as a result, the markets can go down. Now, I have seen scenarios where a certain out of the money written put option had a lot of open interest. And when that was breached, then the underlying actually went down further by two, three, five percent as a result of uh, long unwinding in this particular scenario. And the same happens on the upside as well. When the huge open interest on call side is breached, then as a result, because of short covering, the underlying shoots up further by one, two, three and even five percent. Right. However, in order to look at open interest only, and again, I'm saying do not look at these things in exclusivity. You cannot really always look at only open interest and then make some trades. So traders, especially the professional option writers, are very agile when it comes to tracking where the underlying is going. And if it appears to them that the underlying is actually going to breach a certain sold put position and it has very high open interest, they would quickly square off their position, be it in profits or losses. They would not wait. Those who wait are the ones who are inexperienced option writers, right? So let's say in the morning you saw that it has very high open interest. You sold your option and let's say you're not someone who's tracking the market. And all of a sudden, if that strike is breached, you wouldn't even know that the open interest on that particular strike has already come down drastically. Why? Right? People have already booked out either profits or losses, but they didn't really want to pile on to their losses by sticking with that particular strike, right? And if you're not someone who cannot track markets, then I would say do not rely too much on open positions as well. They can actually sometimes induce huge losses on your account. And of course, even though we're saying that a huge open interest on out of the money put strike can act as a support, there are often chances that huge open interest buildup can also start acting as indication that traders are now taking bearish position and now they're buying options. And when that strike is breached, often you would see that call writers would start writing call at that particular strike. And now that strike would start acting as a resistance, right? So there's always this risk that open interest may be misinterpreted by us. And that's why you cannot really rely on open interest in an exclusive manner, right? People rely too much on open interest. They would try to predict where the expiry is going to be as a result of open interest. But I have seen time and again that open interest is thrown out of the window 
when the underlying wants to go to a certain level, right? And under those scenarios, exclusively looking at open interest can be detrimental. And same is Max Payne. Maybe not many traders actually look at Max Payne. And what is Max Payne? It is the strike where all the option buyers will take maximum losses. I do acknowledge the fact that market makers do manipulate the prices of underlyings near or at expiry. However, being able to answer the level where the expiry would occur with the help of Max Payne is not really a thought that I subscribe to. I think that Max Payne becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you have Max Payne and uh, let's say three out of 12 times the expiry did occur very close to that Max Payne level. People will say that, hey, look, Max Payne works, right? And there are no set formulas as well to derive Max Payne levels. Different softwares would have different Max Payne levels. So if there is absolutely no consensus on where that particular value is, how can we rely on it? At least when it comes to Greeks, there is a consensus, right? You know that a 20 delta is this strike, even if you're looking at different softwares or broker platforms, the 20 delta would more or less be the same strike, right? But not so much on the max pain. The max pain can vary from one trader's calculation to another and one software's calculation to another. So that's why do not rely too much on max pain as well. This is a concept that you are bombarded with when you start off as an option uh, trader. And at certain point in time, you would realize that max pain is nothing but a useless piece of information that you shouldn't even bother about at all. Mistake number seven, not learning the options basics and fundamentals. You should not only know how options work, how Greeks work and everything related to option trading, but you should also know the different strategies that is both directional and non-directional strategies, right? One of the beauty of uh, being an option writer is that you even make money when the markets remain sideways or they are consolidating in a very tight range, right? You can just take the non-directional strategies and you would make money. Therefore, you should always know both directional and non-directional strategies, at least know half a dozen of them. And you should also know their adjustments. So learn, keep on learning and make sure that you are able to make your trade plans and then execute them by properly adjusting your strategies as well as knowing how a particular adjustment works on a particular strategy, right? So do not start trading in options until you haven't really learned them. Even if you're learning from some courses, some books or some YouTube videos, it's all fine, right? But do not jump into option trading before making sure that you're at least at a proficient level when it comes to trading in options. And theoretically, you should know each and everything related to not just the options as instruments, but how the exchanges actually have rules around option trading, how the in the money option is exercised, how the out of the money option can give you losses or profits, and how the margin rules work, how the margin can increase or decrease as a result of the price action of the underlying, right? And how the broker blocks your, your capital if the margin requirement increases as your in the money option, start going deeper in the money and so on, right? So there are a lot of these smaller rules um, that you should try to learn. If you are a beginner, then of course you will take a lot of time. Some of them you would learn the hard way, but try to gather as much information as possible, right? So you should know each and everything about options as trading instruments. And a somewhat related mistake, which is mistake number eight is, option writers often become one trick pony right and they only rely on very simple looking strategies say vertical spreads or iron condors right however if you want to be a proficient option writer and if you want to take it very seriously and hopefully make it as your career choice as well in future then you will have to become an expert in a lot of other strategies as well and not just in these simpler looking strategies like vertical spreads iron condors and so on for example, diagonal spreads and calendar spreads, they are one of the most complex strategies and they're also very low risk strategies. And believe it or not, but a lot of professional option writers usually often stick with just these two strategies, right? And Ironfly is another one that a lot of professional option writers rely on. So do not be a one trick pony. At least make sure that you know half a dozen directional and non-directional strategies along with their adjustments and also along with the different scenarios when these kind of strategies can be taken upon and the timing at which you should go in and start doing adjustments. Okay, so whatever mistakes that we've covered so far are all about what you should be avoiding. This mistake, mistake number nine, which also happens to be the last one, is not just a mistake, but it is also a solution. And that is option writers often ignoring to learn charting and various technical studies. A chart is nothing but the whole truth. 
When you're looking at chart, you're looking at the price action. You're looking at the current level at which a particular asset is trading, and that is the consensus level. The markets know that it should be trading here. The markets want this asset to be trading here. That's why it's trading here. All the fundamental analysis, all the technical analysis has already been boiled down to the price of the underlying. And as a result, it behooves the option writers to learn charting. From basics such as knowing the candlestick types and identifying the supports and resistances, knowing what the stop losses are and knowing when to enter, knowing when the support would be breached. So now they should be looking to short this particular asset or knowing when the resistance is breached and now they should be looking to go long on that particular asset. So you should bring in all these aspects related to charting when it comes to option writing. I know a lot of option writers and it really hurts me a lot to see that they do not look at charts at all. Right. So coming back to, let's say, the mistake of looking just at Delta and not looking at anything else. Let's say a stock has fallen a lot. And now you think that maybe there's going to be some kind of a price reversal and it'll start going back up. So let me sell 20 Delta from here that it will not really go down to 20 Delta. Right. You think that it's far out of the money already and the stock has already corrected so much. But little do you know that actually the stock is about to break its support and about to go down further. Right. As a result, what's going to happen is you sold 20 strike purely looking at Delta. You didn't really look at the charts. You didn't know that a major support is about to be broken. Right. And as a result, you would end up taking losses. So I don't understand the logic of trading and not looking at charts. And option writers are the only breed in this world that do this mistake. Any other trader, you talk to them, they would say, what's the point in trading if you're not even looking at charts? However, many option writers often claim that you do not really have to look at the charts if you're good at adjustments, if you're good at taking proper trades, and let's say if you're good at tweaks. But no, let me tell you something. There's nothing more important than learning how to look at charts and knowing how the particular underlying can behave. Let's say you know charting, you know technical studies, you know the patterns, you know that now the inverted head and shoulder breakout is happening and now the stock is going to run up. It becomes very, very easy for you to start taking your positions as a result, right? Now you're trading in consensus with other traders, right? Now you're not going to go against the tide. You're trying to flow with the tide and this is all that matters, right? If you are trading where the consensus is, you would always be a profitable trader. So the least that you should know is candlestick types, some technical studies, know when to enter, know what your stop losses should be, and know the supports and resistance levels. If you know some of the candlestick patterns, if, if you know how to identify the outperforming stocks, if you know how to identify high beta stocks to trade options on. So if you know a little bit of all these things, then it makes a lot of improvement to your option writing journey, right? And in order to help you all, I have already kicked off a video series where I will be sharing with you a lot of technical indicators, a lot of candlestick types, a lot of candlestick patterns and some of the oscillators. And I would also be sharing the entire system with you that you can not only use for option trading, but also even if you want to do say swing trading or positional trading, because what the beginner traders really look for is entire system. However, what they end up finding is information in bits and pieces. They would learn about something new and they would try to include that into their existing system and their existing systems might already be broken. And by adding a new piece of information, their system will completely go haywire. So the idea behind releasing this series of videos is to eventually share the systems with you that you can readily take and start taking some profitable trades. So you would know how to enter, when to enter, when to exit, what should be your stop losses and what is it that you should be looking at, how to pick up the stocks, how to find a particular stock to actually start trading on it and how do you assess your risk reward before entering into a trade, right? So going forward, I would be releasing heaps of videos on technical analysis. The entire year of 2022 would be dedicated to learning technical analysis and I have a lot of content to share with you guys. So make sure that you are following along on this journey and I look forward to seeing you in next video where I'll be talking about the supports and resistance levels. So this is all that I wanted to share in this video. I hope you found it useful and I sincerely hope that this time we don't really do any editing mistakes and this video goes through as it is. Thank you and I'll see you soon.